Alright, good Sunday evening to you, Belvoir Church. Hope that you're doing well tonight. Uh, just back for some uh, Bible study here, time in, in God's Word. Hope that uh, you've been encouraged by these uh, videos and uh, that at least you'd be able to have some spiritual food to feast on. Uh, we certainly don't want anybody spiritually starving out there uh, in these days. It's certainly uh, take an opportunity of, of the lax type life and uh, we're some, some people have continued on as if there was no uh, pandemic, whatever the case may be with you, uh, you know, we want these videos to encourage you and help you. And if you have your Bibles tonight, you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Title of the message tonight is The Right Chase. The Right Chase tonight. I want to ask a question Are you on the right chase in life? And I want to read the passage of Scripture and then we'll go into uh, the Word of God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith, uh, let us be therewith content. But they that will they will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings upon the preaching of your word tonight. Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand and know what chase that we're in in life. What are we chasing after? Lord, are we pleasing you in our life or are we pleasing ourselves? Lord, I pray that we would find the right pursuit in life. And Lord, that we would continue to pursue that until the day that you come to call us home. Lord, I pray we make the right decisions in this area. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I thought about a few people in life that I wanted to ask you about. One of them's kind of comical. But when you think of Wiley E. Coyote, what do you think about? Now, some people didn't even know his name was Wiley E. Coyote. How many of you remember the road runner, right? Uh, beep, beep. Boom, he runs off, you know, and then the... Uh, coyote's always trying to blow him up, destroy him, so he could eat him, right? Uh, the pursuit of the coyote's life is the roadrunner. He lives to eat the roadrunner, though he never, uh, never, ever, ever on screen we ever see him catch the roadrunner. Uh, but you can tell that it's his desire, it's his drive, it's his pursuit in life to conquer that roadrunner. Let me give you another a couple of names. How about Michael Jordan? For those of you in my age range, and maybe a little older, uh, Michael Jordan is the basketball star of all basketball stars. I remember growing up, uh, you know, 23 jerseys all over the place. Jordans, you know, I don't even know if they still make those. Uh, but, you know, when you think of Michael Jordan, what do you think about? Well, for those of you who are a little younger, uh, and maybe I know some of our younger guys that we're talking about Michael Jordan, like, Psh, man, LeBron James, LeBron James. What do you think about when you hear the name LeBron James? You think about those guys, you think about their drive to play basketball. They have an energy, they have a pursuit of excellence in the sport of basketball. Uh, and you hear them tell their stories about how they practice and practice and practice. And surely we hear the statement, practice makes perfect. And, uh, you know, they didn't become superstars overnight. Well, it's a, it's a thirsting drive in their life and a pursuit in their life to be the best that they can be. Now, we can go all night long on different famous people and their drives and their pursuits in life, but what did they invest? I mean, how did they invest their lives? It's very clear that that question is answered uh, by watching them play basketball. Uh, and, and so they invest their lives into what they desire to better themselves. You see, you are known tonight by what you chase after in life. What consumes you? What drives you? What do you find yourself investing time in? What are you chasing after today? Your life gives us the true answer to that question. Paul here in the text was warning Timothy about false teachers 
here in chapter 6. And in the midst of this topic, gives encouragement to us all to chase the right things in life. Notice he tells uh, Timothy there in uh, verse 11, he says, But thou, O man, again, flee these things and follow after. Follow after there. That phrase, follow after, means to chase. It means to pursue earnestly. It, it, the idea of genuinely pursuing. He says, I want you to pursue these things. So this, this text here is all about pursuit. It's all about chasing. There's two chases that we have in this text right now. The reality is... You and me are chasing either the right path or we're chasing the wrong path. We're chasing the right things or we're chasing the wrong things. There's no middle ground here. You are either on the either or column here tonight. You're either in the right chase or you're in the wrong chase. And it's up to you to determine what chase you're in. I can't determine that for you. But folks, the fact of the matter is your life bears the answer out. People know what you desire. People know the pursuit of your life. I think it's important here. God is calling our attention to what is our pursuit in life? What is our aim in life? What is our goal? What is our reach in life? What are we attempting to do in life? Are we running for Christ or are we running for ourselves? Are we chasing the heart of God or are we chasing the things of the world? Jesus said it very, very wonderfully in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. You know, Jesus told us, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one or despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now you say, what is mammon? Uh, the word mammon there just means treasures, or I like to say in our modern vernacular, materialism. God says you can't serve me and things at the same time. You have one master. It's either things or it's either me. You have one drive. It's either me or things. And I believe this hits the church right between the eyes tonight because a lot of us have deviated in our chase and pursuit of life. We've deviated from what we really need to be pursuing in our life. And I ask you the question tonight, what chase are you pursuing? What path are you taking that's conveyed to us? What path out of the two paths that we see here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 are you on? What, what is your chase? Well, we already prayed, so let's get into it. In verses 6 and 8, he gives us some perspective before we decide the chases. There's two chases that are presented to us. In verses 9 through 12, he gives us the two chases. But in verses 6 through 8, he wants to give Timothy some perspective on life. He wants to give you and I some perspective. To really, Before we really just make a decision on this chase, there's some things we need to understand about life and what God wants from us. So let's look at that, just a few things. Some things to think about as we choose our chase. Well, look there in verse 6 of chapter, or chapter 6. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, I am, we're in a, right in the middle of, of a point that Paul's trying to make. But for sake of time, I wanted to stay in the six verses. Uh, but he's certainly been talking about this in the previous verses. But verse 6, but godliness and content, with contentment is great gain. He wants us to understand that godliness and contentment are great gain. The word gain there in the Greek means acquisitions. You know, you hear the businessmen talk about, well, I have these acquisitions. Well, you know, God here is trying to say that for the Christian, our acquisitions are not things. It's being godly and being content. That is what brings the Christian truly great acquisitions, great gain, uh, if you will. Living for God and being satisfied in Him. That's what it means. Being godly is being like God. It's God-likeness. Being like Him. Walking holy. Living for Him. Serving Him. And being content. The idea of being satisfied in Him. That He is all that we need. He is our sufficiency. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, if you remember. And so I won't go stay there too long. But again, uh, uh, you, you are rich and have everything that you need when life when your life is in God's hands. Your life is in God's hands. Think about it with me. Godliness and contentment are great gain. You know, the world has this idea that money is great gain, that having uh, tall buildings and great accomplishments and, and great awards and trophies, that, that's great gain. But the Bible lets us know that godliness and contentment in God and who he is, that is truly what great gain is in life. You want to find a truly successful person. 
Uh, by the way, you've heard me preach this before, but it goes hand in hand with what I'm preaching on tonight. Uh, the only time you ever find the word success is there in the book of jo uh, Joshua, chapter 1, I believe in verse 8. And, and it's associated with following the Lord and following his word. How about that? Success uh, comes as we live for God and do for him. That is true success in this life. Again, we don't live for this life, we live for the next. And this is something that he's really trying to point us out to here. You'll definitely see that uh, with the next point. Look at verse 7 there. So not only is godliness, so something to keep in mind, we're, we're trying to choose which chase, which aim uh, we're going to have in life. What are we going to be running after in life? Well, uh, again, God wants to remind us, godliness and contentment brings great gain in the life of a believer. But then secondly, he wants us to understand that this life that we're living on this earth will end someday. Notice what he says there in verse 7. He says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. There's a lot of things in this life that we don't know about. But notice what the Bible says that is for certain here in the Word. It's certain that your life and my life is one day going to end. There, there's coming a time. Matter of fact, God knows that day on his mind. He knows whether it's tomorrow he knows whether it's next week. He knows if it's 30 years from now. He knows your death day. Hey, we may not even see our death day. Jesus might return and come get us. It might be tomorrow. Hey, whatever the case may be, God knows our end on this life, in this world. Uh, and he's letting us know that this is going to come to an end. So be careful how you invest your life because everything you see is going to one day come to an end. And everything you see is never going to matter anymore. The trophies are not going to matter. The money is not going to matter. The accomplishments are not going to matter. The things of this earth are not going to matter one iota in heaven. That's something to think about. When we're trying to choose which path we're going to run, which direction we're going to go, that's something we've got to think about tonight. It brings perspective to know that our life is, is not long on this earth. There's coming a point where it's going to end. And the thing is that gets me as a pastor, you know, I feel like a lot of times Christians live our lives as if we're going to live forever. I mean, that's even true in the unsaved world. We live our lives like we've got no, I mean, we've got as much time as we want. And the fact of the matter is we've got very little time on this earth. It's something to think about when we think about our life's goals and our life's chases, so to speak. It's going to one day end. And what he says for certain is you can't take anything you acquire in this life with you to the next. It's a very, very clear statement. You, know, you don't have to have a Greek dictionary to understand what he's saying here. He's saying when you die, you can't take anything with you. You came into this world naked and empty, and you're going to come out empty. Understand, you're not carrying anything with you. You know, I was watching the uh, National Geographic uh, episode. Uh, we got Disney Plus and we were watching that National Geographic while I was on the treadmill the other night. And um, they were talking about one of the pharaohs. They found the land of the dead or I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, it's where all the pharaohs are buried. And they were in there and they found the tomb and, and they found this tomb and it was kind of a groundbreaking thing way back when. And, and when they opened the tomb, they found one of the most exhausted uh, types of uh, furnitures and all kinds of collections of ancient Egypt and I mean it had all this gold and I mean there was tons of gold in that tomb and then they mentioned the fact that the reason why they stored all I mean I'm talking folks there was a, a building full of gold and priceless artifacts in that room and the statement was made by the commentator that they buried all those treasures so that they could take those treasures with the pharaohs uh, in, their, in their afterlife well, you know, it's very interesting to me that 2,000 some years later or 3,000 years, however, I know it's thousands of years, it's probably two or 3,000 years, uh, you do the math there and take the time to do that before service tonight, but you think about that, that, that they dig it up and it's still there. It's still collecting dirt. It's still collecting dust. They had not taken it with them. You want to know why? Because you can't. When you live this life and you close your eyes, you can't carry nothing with you. That's why U-Haul is not invested in the funeral home business, folks. There's no U-Haul behind your hearse. You, you, can't, you can't carry this things of this life. You can't take your home with you. You can't take your bank account with you. You can't take your trophies with you. You can't take your accomplishments with you. You can't do that. Jesus said here, God said, it's certain that you brought, look, you can't take anything with you when you leave this world. Something to think about. 
So I'm think about it. It gives you and me perspective on choosing the right chase in life. What chase are you chasing? Are you chasing the right path or the wrong path? And God says, as you choose, you make that decision tonight. There's some things you need to understand. Living for me and realizing that I'm all you need. That's a great game. Realizing that you have one life and it's going to end. And you better choose wisely. And remember, you can't carry the things of this life with you. You can't, everything that you acquire, everything you work towards, the trophies, the money, the cop, those things, they stay right here when you come, when you leave this world. Not only that, the Bible lets us know, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. The Bible says our life is but a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. But then thirdly, looking at some perspective, godliness, contentment, a great gain. Uh, life will end someday, so keep in mind you can't carry anything with you. But then thirdly, God will supply all our needs. Notice what he says there in verse 8. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Uh, we don't have to chase after anything other than him, folks. Having there, the word having is a very interesting word. It means to continue to have. It speaks to the provision of God. It speaks to the idea that God takes care of his children. And I don't have to go running out trying to get the biggest bank account. I don't have to go running out trying to do all the uh, things the world's doing and, and try to better my... Look, God, he will supply everything that you and I need. Let's keep him first and everything else will fall into place. The Bible says to seek ye first the kingdom of God and then all these and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. What are these things? It's the things that we uh, the, the things that we need. He talks about that in Matthew chapter 6. So, but we got to keep him first, folks. You know, a lot of us put the cart before we before the horse. Understand, it's him first and things next, things last. Understand, things will fall into place. Uh, the way he wants it to. Now, you look again, uh, you may not be happy with the lot you've been dealt, but hey, God's in control. You need to understand uh, that when we keep him first, he will supply every need. I ain't talking about wants. What, what gets us in trouble when it comes to chasing the right chase, when it comes to chasing the right path versus the wrong path, a lot of times it has a lot to do with our desires, uh, our, our wants, not our needs. But I'm telling you tonight, what the Bible's saying here is you think about what path you're taking when you take the right path for, for God. When you choose to chase the right things in life, God says, I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will meet your needs. You'll be content. You'll be satisfied. That word means to have enough. You know, I may not have the fastest boat in the world. I may not have the biggest house in the world. I may not have the fastest car in the world. I may not have, you may look at my little red bug as I go down the road and not think much. But let me tell you, I have everything I need. I've got food on my table and clothes on my back. I've got the desires of my prayer life answered. I've got a child on the way. Thank God. I've got a beautiful wife who loves me. I mean, think about all those things. You know, a roof over my head. God provides. You know, truly, you may not think much, but according to the Bible, I'm rich. If you know Christ, you're rich. If you're satisfied and content in Him and living for Him, you're richer than Bill Gates. We need to understand that tonight. Again, perspective, perspective, perspective. The Bible says in Philippians, but my God shall supply all, all, all your need according to His riches and glory, folks. For riches, or she riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My Father is the richest being in all the universe, and He is taking care of me. I need nothing tonight but him. Think about that for a minute. Our Heavenly Father tonight is the richest being in all the universe. Folks, look, I want you to do, do me a favor. Look out your window right now. And look all around as much as you can. It's all His. Look around your home. It's all His. It's His. It's His world. I'm His creation. It's all His, folks. He owns the cattle on Thousand Hill and He owns the hills too. Understand that. We have the richest Father in all of the universe. I don't need anything else. I have all that I need in him. Great, great perspective. Some of us tonight need to quit chasing down the wrong path. Some of us are chasing the wrong things in life. Some of us have our aim in the wrong place. And we need that perspective to bring us back to some reason here. And understand 
that godliness and contentment brings great gain. Not money, trophies, and accomplishments. In this life, this life's going to end one day. There's going to come a time when we draw our last breath. We can't take anything with us. And thirdly, if we'll live for God, he'll take care of our needs. We won't want for anything. He is our shepherd. As David said, I shall not want. That, that phrase there, a preacher was saying, what it literally translates to in the Hebrew is, I'll have need of nothing. And I want you to know tonight, based on my own personal testimony in life, the word of God is true there. You'll have need of nothing. Secondly, the wrong case. So we've got some perspective. Now he takes an in-depth look at the two chases. There's the first chase, and it is the wrong chase. Look at verses 9 and 10. Notice the language that is used here. But they that will be rich, that word will there implies desire. It means to aim for. It really has the idea of chasing again. Those that chase after riches, those that chase after material things in this life, those that chase after fleeting things that won't last for all eternity, they shall fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Do you hear what God is saying tonight? If you go the route of riches, if you go the route of the material things of life, if your aim is to be the richest person in Pitt County, if your aim is, is to just make all the money in this world and to have all the great things and the greatest cars and the greatest houses and, and, the, and the greatest trophies in your trophy case and the greatest accomplishments, if that's your goal, understand what God is saying here. Think about where it leads. Think about the path. Think about the path that you're chasing and what it does to you. There are consequences tonight to the choices. This passage tells us there are consequences to the way we live. It does matter how we live in this life. It does matter what we make the goal and aim and the chase of our life. We're talking about the right chase. Are you on the wrong chase or the right chase? And here he tells us some consequences of the wrong chase in our life. I know of many of people in my life that fall prey to this chase. And they're still reeling from the, from the implications of it. Suffering tonight from the implications of it. Those that chase after things will certainly reap the horrors. Now look at the language here. Notice he says, fall into temptation and a snare. The word fall means to fall among robbers. It means to fall into one's power. It's the idea, really, of slavery. You become slave to riches. And I look, I know a lot of people like that. They're living for one more dollar, and that's it. They're not faithful to church. They're not faithful to the things of God, but they're faithful to sports. They're faithful to this. They're faithful to that. Everything else but God takes the last on the list. But understand what it says. These things... You become slave to. When you begin to run after riches and the material things of this life, you become slave to them. Fall into temptation and a snare. The word snare means trap. It also means noose. <clears throat> May I submit to you tonight that those that are living this chase and chasing after this aim of, of, of money and materialism, they're hanging their own selves. They're supplying their own noose. Notice it says it's a snare. Notice what he says there. He says that many foolish and hurtful lusts there. In verse 9. Into many foolish and hurtful lusts. The word hurtful lust. We all know the word uh, foolish. It's foolish. But hurtful lust means injurious desires. Things that will hurt you. Literally, the person going down this path, choosing this chase, choosing this aim in their life, they're only hurting their own self. And buddy, let me tell you, I have seen and heard many tales of what riches and the things of this world will do. I never forget working with, a, with someone and, and uh, trying to help them out in this life and, and that they gave their heart to Jesus and they were doing really well. And for years, they served God. And then all of a sudden, 
things of this world started creeping in. The things of this life, things, girlfriend, money, drugs, alcohol, began to consume their life. And to this day, it's, it's nearly destroyed their life. You see, these things are injurious. We think that everything looks good. Oh, money is great. Mo money, mo money, mo money, right? It's not all it's cracked up to be. Because the pursuit of that, making that our aim in life, will lead to destruction. He says that. Which drown men. Listen to the next phrase. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. We all kind of know what that means, but the word perdition there, listen to what it means in the Greek. Loss of well-being. Ruin. Waste. The idea of wasting away your life. You see tonight, you may think that you're living it up. You have everything. Preacher, I don't need the church. I don't need that. I don't need that religion. I don't need Jesus. I don't need this or that. I can live my life the way I want to. I can enjoy the splendors of these things. And even as a Christian, you may say, Preacher, I ain't got to be 100% faithful. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. It's okay. I can do what I want to do and be there when I want to be there. I can do all those things. What God is saying here, understand that when you begin to make your focus in life, not Jesus, when you begin to make your focus in life on things and riches and accomplishments and trophies, what the Bible says here, you will waste your life away. You're just wasting your life. It's a loss of your own well-being. It's destruction. You're drowning yourself in destruction and despair. This, this path, this chase does not sound worth it, does it? That's because this world doesn't portray it like that. But God does. Listen to what God says. He said here, the love of money is the root of all evil in verse 10. The love of money is one word in the Greek. It literally has the idea of greed, the desire of materialism. It's, it's the idea of greed, self-gratification. He said, which some, now, now we'll say this, he's not saying money is evil. He's saying the love of money is evil. I've known some rich people in my life that have done great things for the cause of Christ. It's because money doesn't have them. It's okay to have a little money as long as money don't own you. Remember, remember back in the other point, you can be your slave. You can become a slave of that desire. I know a lot of people, money doesn't own them. Jesus does. And they use their money to glorify God in his work, and do great things. So passage is not saying money is evil. It's saying that desire, making that focal point of your life, making uh, the, the desire is not Christ, but your desire is to make more money and to have all the material wealth that you can gain, the accomplishments, the trophies. That, my friends, is the root of all evil. Greed. Desire for oneself. God says that you're wasting your life. Which, while some coveted after, the word that they're coveted after actually has the apply of a chase to reach after, to give oneself up to the pursuit of money. They have erred from the faith, the Bible says. And that, listen to what he said. That this path, this chase, has led believers to stray from their faith. And let me tell you, that story I just shared, it, it happens all the time in our local churches where, where somebody begins to allow the things of this world to creep in. And the more and more the world pushes in, the more and more money pushes in, the more and more we begin to allow those things to dominate our pursuit in life, the less and less that we'll come to, to getting into the Word and, and spending time with God and being close to Him. It'll continually push God away, push our, the Lord Jesus Christ out of our life to a point where we'll stray from the faith, as we've talked about here. When you choose, when you choose to make things the priority of your life, the chase of your life, you're in grave danger of erring, straying from the faith. I'm telling you folks, I see it happen all the time. Oh, preacher, I can handle it. It's okay. Be careful. There's a reason why God warned us here. Again, he said, they have erred from the faith and pierced. 
themselves through with many sorrows. The word pierce there means to torture oneself with sorrow. It's the apply of mental torture, anguish, agony. And notice he says not just one sorrow, he says many sorrows. The word sorrow means consuming grief and pain. Folks, I don't know about you, but there ain't nobody who would sign up to a life like that. But too often we get duped and fooled like money's going to satisfy us. Like, like the things of this world are going to satisfy us. Material things. The more and more we have, the more happy we are. Do you know that the opposite has been proven true? I, I've got a story here that I want to read to you. I'm going to try to cut out some of it for sake of time. But I thought it was very interesting. It's from the Huff Post. It was written in 2017. It said that I just finished writing a story for a money magazine about people who feel having a lot of money can be a burden as much as a blessing. One advisor said he had a client who left his sons a family business and left each of his two daughters about $1.5 million in cash and real estate. Within three years, the daughters had spent all the money and had mortgaged their houses and lost them. They even badgered their brothers for money saying, Daddy would want you to take care of us. Think about it. There are countless stories of lottery winners and professional athletes who get a windfall uh, only to see their relationships destroyed as they wind up in legal battles with friends and loved ones who feel they are owned a piece of the bounty. And some come into money so quickly they can't rein in their spending. They run right through it and end up with nothing. There is story after story after story after story of that being true. Folks, you know what that tells us? Things can't satisfy us. This chase here will never satisfy you. And it ends in destruction. That's what the Bible says. Now, this same journalist here was writing. He says, as I was working on this story, my two-year-old son, Eddie, woke up from his nap, took his pacifier out of his mouth, and flung it across the room like a discarded piece of trash. He then took the bottle I had in my hand and grabbed it and began sucking on it like a thirsty monkey. He then flung his binky across the room and I lifted out of the crib, I lifted him out of the crib, deposited him on the floor, and he wandered around the room looking down toward the floor and began saying, singing, Binky, where are you? Using deduction, I thought, if it's not under his crib or anywhere else on the floor, it's got to be in the box of Thomas the Train Tracks that I slid next to his crib one day when I was trying to tidy up. I looked inside, and not only was the binky in there, but there were two others that were had apparently fallen in there from the previous days when he had tossed them out of the crib. He seems to have a pretty consistent bank shot. I imagined every time he threw the pacifier from his mouth, it would have hit the wall and in the same spot before falling into the box of train tracks. When I showed Eddie the three binkies, his eyes lit up. He snatched all of them and tried to put all three in his mouth at once. When that didn't work, he tried to put in one and then the other. That didn't work either. He wound up putting a green one in his mouth, but then he changed his mind and stuck to the blue one. And then I told him, I said, give me the other two. I, and no, I, he said, and put his hands with the two remaining binkies behind his back. Come, come on, cough them up. Give me the binkies. He shook his head, no. One binky per child, I said, again reaching for them. He was steadfast in his defiance, holding so tightly onto the two binkies that I could not see, that I could see the rubber edges bending in his hands. What are you going to do with three binkies, I asked my child. He said, I need two outside, he said, removing the binky in his mouth long enough to speak. Why, I said, I, he says, I need two outside. Again, his powers of persuasion right now consists of repetition. You can only take one outside. I said and, let, and left the room for a moment and grabbed my cell phone as I knew we would soon be heading out downstairs. When I returned to his room, he had gone into the drawer in his diaper changing table where we store the binkies and took out two more. He now has four in his hand and one in his mouth. It is as if he, the more binkies he had, the more he needed. Anything less would not no longer suffice. Go put them back, I said, as two of, the, two of us approached the top of the, of the stairs. Put them back, I told Eddie, Eddie, again, and pointed at the drawer uh, of the changing table. Eddie looked at me and got angry and threw the binkies down the stairs. They bounced and then scattered. Though 
most of them wedged along the side of the steps. And I walked down a couple of steps and picked them up. And as I headed back towards this room and put them in a drawer, my son began to cry. Now listen to the last part of this article. I don't know the salvation or condition or the, the spiritual condition of this person who wrote this. But they made an astute observation about life in this thing, in this matter. She said, and I quote, I wasn't sure whether it's because he had a grand plan for the binkies and I'd put the kibosh on it. And if it were simply a matter of taking something away from or if it was simply a matter of something taking away from him, regardless of how many of them he had, one thing was clear. Listen to this. An overabundance of any kind leads to misery. How about that? An overabundance of any kind leads to misery. You know what? She's actually, doesn't even realize it, but she's quoting the Bible. Things don't satisfy. Look, binkies. You can have 20 million binkies and it still won't satisfy the baby. And the same thing is true with money. You can have 20 billion dollars and it still won't satisfy you. You can chase that to the ends of this earth and you still won't find satisfaction. Did you know in the book of Ecclesiastes, the wisest man on the earth apart from Jesus Christ, Solomon, he pursued after riches and accomplishments and great things. That whole book is about the, the purpose of life. And the wisest man determined at the end of it, he said, he let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let's fear God and keep his commandments. What he is saying here is riches. Solomon said riches can't satisfy you. Things can't satisfy you. Accomplishments can't satisfy you. Having a name in the land can't satisfy you. There's only one thing that brings satisfaction, and that is serving and pleasing God with your life. That is pleasing. That is satisfying. That is eternal. We understand this is what God's saying. The, the, the wrong chase will do nothing but bring suffering. But then lastly, he sees in verse 11 and 12 the right chase. The right chase. So we got some perspective. Godliness and contentment is great gain. This life's going to end. You can't take nothing with you. God will supply all your needs. So with that perspective, you've got to choose the right chase. We see the wrong chase and the horrors that come with the wrong chase and the wrong pursuits in life. But then we see the right pursuit. Look at the, the urging of Apostle Paul to Timothy. Look at verse 11 through 12. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Get away from that chase. You don't want to be a part of that life. You don't want to be, you don't want to make those things your goal in life. Here's what you need to chase after. This is what he says. Fight. He says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Can I implement this just for sake of the sermon? Uh, because it, it does no injustice to the text. And chase after righteousness. This is what he's saying. Follow after means to chase after, to pursue, to chase after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on the eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. He's saying here, this is the right chase, Paul, or uh, Timothy. Timothy, that's the wrong chase, but now I'm going to show you the right chase. I'm going to show you what you need to make your life all about. I'm going to show you what you need to set as your life goals in this life. The right chase. Follow after. To desire. To pursue earnestly is what it means. A continual command. It literally means to continue pursuing. To continue chasing. To make every effort. To strive after. To desire. To pursue. What he is saying is we are to make these things our life's goals. Notice what he says to make our life goals. He says to follow after righteousness. The word righteousness means to do right, to do what God requires. He says what you need to do, the right chase and the right aim in life. Young person, old person, I don't care who you are tonight, make your aim in life to follow the word of God, obey the word of God, put it into practice in your life, and follow it with all your heart, mind, and soul. Live a righteous life. It only happens as we live for Christ. And Jesus in us will help us live that kind of life. That's a sermon for another day. But again, aim for righteousness. Chase, run, pursue after righteousness. Pursue godliness, he says. Though godliness there means godly living, reverence and honor towards God. Honoring God with our life. Keeping him first in our life. Being like him. Allowing our lives to revolve around him. Yes, he is our God. He is our creator. He's not somebody that we listen to and, and, and adhere to two days a week, Sunday and Wednesday. No, it's a 24-7 deal, folks. It's a lifestyle. Godliness. Pursue righteousness. Pursue godliness. Then he says pursue faith. 
trust and confidence in God. Pursue a life of faith and trust in God. Pursue love. That's the agape love, sacrificial love. Love for men and God. I'm sure that applies both there. How do I say that? Because the Bible says that's linked. The Bible says if you love God, you'll love men. You'll love women. You'll love your brothers and sisters in Christ. You will love them. It's a natural thing. If you love God, you love others. And, and God says here, pursue love. Pursue love of the brethren and the sisters in, in your church. Love them with all your heart, mind, and soul. Yeah, they're different. Yeah, they've got opinions you don't like. But that doesn't change the command that God's given us to love them. We're to pursue love in our life. We're to make it our aim to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul and love others. Make it our aim in life. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and patience. The word patience there is the word for endurance and perseverance. We're to pursue in endurance, folks. This, this life is a battle. He even calls it the good fight there in the next verse. <clears throat> We're going to have to have perseverance. If you're going to make this chase your chase tonight, if you're going to focus on him and run the race that God has set before you, and you're going to chase after God and his righteousness, you're going to chase after it's going to take endurance and patience <clears throat> and meekness, gentle kindness, humility. Pursue humility. We talked about that Wednesday night. And then he says there in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Folks, it is a fight, but it's a good fight. It's hard to serve God sometimes. Oh, preacher, I want to be out in the world doing this and doing that and doing that. You know, and again, as a Christian, we ought not to be woefully present for God. We ought to be excited about God. Hey, look, we ought to show up driving to church excited. But sacrifices have to be made. The devil attacks. It is a fight. Temptation, sin, the flesh. The dead, it's all present. And it's a fight. But it's a good fight. It's a fight worth fighting. And that's the fight God has enlisted us in if you're his child. We're to pursue the fight of faith. We're to lay hold of on eternal life. Get a grip on eternal life. Embrace it. Live it every day. Embrace and lay hold of eternal life. Folks, it's a wonderful thing that when you run this path, when you run this chase, when you're chasing after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness, when you're chasing after fighting the good fight and you're pursuing that life, I want you to understand that eternal life is around the bend. We are living for the next life. This chase is running, you're chasing, you're pursuing for the next life. And that life is forever and ever and ever. So you have a choice. You see, the first chase is the wrong chase. And it's investing everything you got in this life and not for the next life to come. This life is fleeting. The Bible says it's a vapor. Average lifespan, 70, 80 years. What's that compared to eternity? Paul says, lay hold on eternal life. Invest your life in things that are eternal. Lay hold on them. Claim the promise of God and pursue the righteousness of God. Choose the right chase tonight. I ask you a question tonight. What are you chasing in life? Your testimony will tell the story of your chase. And it will be evident. Anybody can look at your life and tell where your chase is. What are you chasing tonight? What are you looking after? What are you chasing after? Are you in the wrong chase? Or are you in the right chase tonight? The wonderful truth is tonight, if you're in the wrong chase, you can stop where you're at and you can go the other way. You can begin the right pursuit in life. Are you keeping Jesus first? I'm telling you, folks, if you'll just keep him first, everything else will fall into place. But if you continue down the wrong chase, we saw the consequences of that. You know tonight the consequences of that. Will you make the right decision? Will you avoid a life of horror into a life 
of sufficiency, into a life of love, into a life of righteousness, Jesus Christ. The choice is yours, the choice is mine to make. What will your choice be? Who are you chasing after? What path are you on? Father, we thank you for this night you've given us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we just pray tonight that we would find ourselves in the right chase. That we're in the right pursuit. We're pursuing the right things in our life. Lord, I pray tonight for your grace. I pray for your restoration. I pray if there would be one, anyone here that, that truly, listen, and that truly needs a touch from you, that maybe their life needs a change, I pray that you would speak to their heart and you would challenge their heart about getting in the right chase. That they would make the right goals. Lord, that they would make you at the forefront of their mind and their heart and they would pursue you with all their heart, mind, and soul. The things of this life are fleeting. Lord, help us to understand that. And we'll thank you for everything you're going to do. In your precious holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And we'll see you Wednesday night. Well, hello there. We're so thankful you could tune in to one of our services online. I hope that uh, you enjoyed your time with us. Uh, we, we're so excited to have you uh, be a part of our online worship. I uh, just wanted to know if you made any kind of spiritual decision or anything like that. We would love to hear about it. Uh, you can let us know by messaging our Facebook page, or you can email me personally at preacherman83 at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you uh, if you made a spiritual decision to give your life to the Lord, uh, whatever that may be. Uh, we would love to, to encourage you in that, but also know and pray for you. Uh, again, I'm going to invite you, if you don't have a home church already and you live in the Greenville, Belvoir, Belvoir area, we would love to have you come join us. You can find the service times on our Facebook page, our website. Uh, and We would just love to have you come join us if you're in the area local. Or if you're out of state and you're just coming through the area, we'd love for you to stop on in and be a part of our service. Uh, but anyway, just wanted to let you know that. And again, as I always tell uh, my people, uh, your pastor loves you. Call me if you need me. And we'll talk to you all later. God bless. Bye-bye.